which comes from a period much later in the 8th century when we do have people writing down what they believe and the stories that they know. This is the Tully Lock Cross, currently um, on loan to us from the National Museum of Ireland, and you can see how it's displayed in Ireland on the left and how we have it displayed in Celts on the right. It is monumental, it is lavish, and it was probably used as a processional cross in ceremonies or rituals in a monastery or church. We know from this period that most people were practicing Christians in Ireland where this was found. And so we can begin to unravel the stories that it told, tells. And I just want to mention a little bit about how this object was found. It was found by divers diving a lake called Tully Lock in Ireland in July 1986. Um, but unfortunately, it did not immediately end up in the National Museum of Ireland and was not properly reported. And in fact, it was only discovered when the finders tried to flog it to the Getty Museum in America, and one of them was subsequently prosecuted. That meant that luckily for us, it did find its way to its proper home in the National Museum of Ireland, but in a much fragmented state. And there was hours and months of conservation that went into rebuilding this object into what you see today. I just wanted to flag that up, that behind these objects, there's huge teams at museums working to prepare these objects for exhibition to come on loan, you know, from Ireland all the way to London. And that um, it's very important when people find things to report them and follow the due process. And it's only because in the end that due process is followed that we're able to have it here at Celts for the first time in Britain. As I said, unlike the Windestrup cauldron, this is something where we can begin to unravel what the scenes might mean. This is a close-up of the top, and you can see it's decorated with a number of metal plates. Some of them are bossed, some of them are interlaced, but two have these panels of a man facing forward with his hands by the side of his head and two serpents coming up beside him. Now, if a scene like this is depicted as an Iron Age artifact, we have to use our kind of best guess at what that scene might have meant. But because in this period, in the 8th century, there's lots of writing, the Bible's being written down, the Gospel stories, and much scripture, we can begin to unpick what it might have meant. And one suggestion is that this scene represents the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Um, but I think there's a better suggestion, mainly because they're so serpent-like rather than lion-like. I think even if you've never seen a lion before, that somebody had described it to you, you still wouldn't quite come out with a snake. And if we look at something called the Canticle of Habakkuk, of which I've extracted the opening at the top of the screen here, we might get a clue as to what it meant. This is a very obscure hymn. And I say it's obscure because today, this is not how it's translated from the Hebrew. Today, that final line no longer reads, between two living things you will become known. <laughs> but in the mists of the years you will become known. But this is the translation that was circulated and popular in the early medieval period. And in fact, Bede, the 7th, 8th century monk and historian, wrote quite extensively about this passage, speculating on what that term might have meant. He thought that perhaps it referred to Jesus' crucifixion, where he was between two thieves, and perhaps it was between these two thieves, these living things, that he became known as Christ. It's also been suggested that this line could be interpreted as referring to Jesus' birth, where he was born between an ox and a donkey. But it seems that this scene might be referring to that very popular um, Canticle of Habakkuk. We know, for example, that it was sung in monasteries at sunrise every single Friday. We also know that it was sung on Good Friday at that all-important ninth hour. So we know this phrase, which no longer exists as part of common Christian liturgy or practices, was incredibly important at that time, to the extent that this motif appears on loads of Christian objects in Ireland and Scotland. And so it's through these writings that we have from the early medieval period that we can begin to understand this object and the fact that this scene, which shows Christ becoming known between two living creatures, um, gets its power, its um, sacred significance as part of a Christian ritual or ceremony. Part of 
of the importance of the discovery of the Tilly Dot Cross just under 30 years ago is the fact that it demonstrates something that art historians and archaeologists have always speculated, and that is that the monumental high crosses that today are still familiar in the landscape of much of Scotland, Ireland and England were based on metal examples. And I'm really pleased in the exhibition we were able to display these two objects in a way that you can draw your own comparisons between these objects. So on the right here we have the cast of St John's Cross from Iona, um, monumental in scale, absolutely massive. And then to the side, the Tully Lock Cross. When you look at the details of the design, they're very similar. Both have these cusped or cut out arms. So here we've got the curved arms here and here. They both have the four bosses on the arms and one in the centre perhaps a reference to the wounds of Christ on the crucifix. And so it shows how discoveries like this get made and they either reinforce our kind of suspicions when we're studying this material or can change our mind. And that's why something like this has been so important for the study of early medieval art. How two different object types across two different mediums, stone and metal, actually share a lot in common. And these designs aren't restricted to just the stone and metal objects of the church. They're also used in books. So this is the next object I'm going to talk to you about. This is the St. Chad Gospels on loan to us from Literal Cathedral. And we're very lucky to have it because it's been very much part of cathedral life and it's used in ceremonies and rituals there. I think it's probably one of the oldest books still in um, use in a religious setting in Britain. But we're not quite sure, so if you know of any others, I would be interested to know. And it's been damaged over its long and varied life. So today, it only now contains the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and the beginning of St Luke. And this is the opening page to the Gospel of St Luke you can see here. And these elaborately illustrated Gospel books telling the life of Jesus were central to Christian preaching and teaching in the churches and monasteries of early medieval Ireland, Scotland and England. The amount of time and resources that went into producing them was extraordinary and demonstrates their importance. The pages are made from vellum, which is calf skin, which would have taken days of soaking, stretching and scraping. The monks themselves spent many, many days intricately painting these scenes, something which I think was akin to an act of devotion in itself. If you can imagine spending hours working on this one task, thinking about what you're committing to a page, whether it's the opening to the gospel, or this absolutely fabulous carpet page here, that kind of concentration is almost meditative, and I think that it was similar to prayer. We know that they would have used expensive and exotic pigments, and they would have been incredibly rare even in their day and valuable objects. So it's even more lucky that we still have it today. Very few of them survive, and I'm sure you probably know by name the others, the Book of Kells and the Lindisfarne Gospels being the most fam famous. This book was written and decorated in the 8th century between the Book of Kells and Lindisfarne. And it has this intricately bright, powerful, and absolutely dense decoration. It's unbelievable. And very recently, I spent some time counting all the beasts on this page. You may question how I choose to spend my time, but it, it felt like a good idea. And I'm glad I did, because I discovered that on this page, which is probably slightly larger than A4, are 110 individual creatures. And I have to say I was astounded by that. I don't think I would have guessed anywhere near as high before I started counting. And what I found fascinating is when you first look at this page, it looks like a complete jumble. Everything's kind of twisted together and smushed together, but actually each creature is completely whole and self-contained. So I've pulled out a couple for you here to show that they're not bleeding into each other, they're not incoherent. Individually they all make perfect sense. So at the top I have a beast, and he's got his face, his snout and his ear. He has his two front legs, his body and two back legs. It's got all the things we need a four-legged creature to have. And the same with the bird. Beak, eye, and ear. I'm not sure what bird has an ear. They all have ears, actually. I don't know why all the birds have ears. And 
then they have this long neck, the wings down here, and then the two clawed feet at the front. And I think that's extraordinary, but the care that's gone into this to make sure that every single beast, every single bird on this page is a completely self-contained thing in its own right. Nothing is fudged. You can follow every single one and get the complete beast. And just the fact that they have crammed this much onto this page that would have, you know, I can't even contemplate how many hours it would have taken to paint this, tells you how important books like this were in the early medieval church. The St. Chad Gospels have been in Litchfield Cathedral since at least the 11th century, which means it's been kept safe and we can now put it on display. Um, recently, it's been on display in their chapter house, and if you can see in the background, you can see some bits from Staffordshire Board. I can recommend if you're ever that way to go and have a look at their chapter house because they have some amazing objects in there. So we know it was in Litchfield Cathedral from around the early 11th century, but much of its life before that is quite unknown to us. For example, we don't know the names of the artists or scribes who wrote it, which is a bit of a bit of a shame, but it's often the case with many early medieval manuscripts. But what we can do is compare it to those famous examples of Kells and Lindisfarne, and there's many similarities which suggest they were probably made at the same monastery, perhaps on Iona, off the coast of West Scotland, or in Lindisfarne itself. But we have some other clues to what this manuscript had been up to before it ended up in Mitchell Cathedral, from the inscriptions and margins. Now this book wasn't created close shut and never added to again. In fact, over the many centuries of its life, people have been writing things in this book in the margins for many centuries. And one of those is a later 9th century Latin inscription, so over a century after this book was made. And it records that the manuscript was presented to the, uh, the altar of St. Taylor in Wales by a man named Gelby, who had bought the manuscript for the price of his horse. Now we know that at this time these books would have been incredibly valuable, so he must have had a very good horse or somebody who didn't really understand what they had. <coughs> and we have further evidence that this manuscript was in Wales from some much later marginalia dating to the 10th century of what we think is possibly the earliest example of written Welsh. And what these are are um, people signing their names or people confirming transactions of land. So they're using the book to swear oaths on it because it was so precious and so sacred. We don't really know how the book ended up at Litchfield Cathedral, but as I say, it means that it's been kept safe over the many, many centuries that it has lived there and it's still such an active part of cathedral life. It means that we're very, very lucky and privileged to be able to display it in Celts, arts and identity. And in fact, I think this is the first Christmas it's going to be away from the cathedral. So I feel very privileged for that. So now I'm going to move forward in time, much forward in time, it's much recent history, to look at my final object of this amazing statue of Caractacus, made in 1859 by John Foley at Mansion House, where the Lord Mayor of London lives. Um, he very imposingly stands in the beginning of our Celtic Revival section to signal that you are out of the archaeology zone and into the modern era. How do we come to use the name Celts? That's what he marks. And I've chosen him as my final object to talk to you about for a number of reasons. Not only his imposing size, but also because to get him out of Mansion House, we had to close the road, remove a chandelier, winch him down the side of the building, all outside bank. <laughs> Um, I'm surprised they let us close the road. So it took tremendous effort to get him here and we're very glad he made it. So I thought he deserved to have a bit more time in the spotlight. Now Caractacus ruled over a large part of southern Britain between 1843 and 47 and he led local resistance against the Romans. He was pushed into Wales where he led further rebellions and further resistance to those terrible Roman invaders. But he was finally defeated and he fled north where he thought he was safe. Unfortunately, he was not safe as Carter Mandua, Queen of the Brigantes, you know, told him, she, told him she would keep him safe and instead rushed him out to the Romans who came to collect him on behalf of Claudius. He ended up in Rome pleading for his life. And Tacitus, who records the stories of Caractacus, gives this his final speech. And his final speech is 
shown to be a very powerful subject in art. This is an engraving, for example, which took on the scene. And his speech to Claudius was so powerful that he um, let him go, spared him his life, and practically lived the rest of his days in Rome. But the memory of Practicus didn't live past the Roman period. After Tacitus wrote him down, he largely became forgotten until his memory was resurrected after the classical texts were rediscovered, translated and printed and disseminated more widely. From the mid 18th century onwards, he became a British hero and the subject of many paintings. And we see in these paintings of Caractacus a stock image emerging, tall, middle-aged, impressive physique, ample moustache, but beardless, thick, uncombed, swept back hair. But this stock image didn't come from nowhere. It was inspired by classical depictions of the ancient Celts and Gauls. And this is the Dying Gaul, a Roman copy of a bronze Hellenistic sculpture. One of the most celebrated works of ancient sculpture to survive from antiquity, and it's engraved and endlessly copied by artists who were inspired by his impressive form and his display of strong emotion. And as these engravings were made, published and disseminated widely, it came to cement this kind of image of the idolised noble warrior, noble Celt and noble Gaul. And when we compare the dying Gaul with his moustache, his talk and his floppy hair, with other images of him, we can see how he was transformed from a classical depiction through this kind of Victorian romantic lens to end up like Caractacus as we see in John Foley's statue. But this image began to hold an increasing political currency. Caractacus, alongside Boudicca, were used by artists to promote British imperialism through a historical reimagining of the nation's past, and Caractacus became a symbol of national loyalty. And it's surely these associations that led the Corporation of London to commission Foley to produce this statue for the Lord Mayor of London's house. It still stands today, as you can see um, to the right, as an enduring example of this British imperial propaganda, of this recreation and reimagining of the ancient British past um, that was such a big feature of the Celtic revival. And thank you for listening. I'd like to say I hope you enjoy our star objects as much as we enjoyed installing them. <laughs>